Hello and welcome to the Art Class Curator podcast. I am Cindy Ingram, your host and the founder of Art Class Curator and the Curated Connections Library. We're here to talk about teaching art with purpose and inspiration, from the daily delights of creativity to the messy mishaps that come with being a teacher. Whether you're driving home from school or cleaning up your classroom for the 15th time today, take a second, take a deep breath, relax those shoulders, and let's get started. Today on the podcast, I am welcoming Trevor Bryan, and he has written the book, The Art of Comprehension. All of the links to his book, as well as resources that we talk about on today's episode, will be on our show notes at artclasscurator.com slash 41. And I really enjoyed this interview with Trevor. We have a lot in common in terms of our mission of art connection in this world. So I hope you enjoy this interview. And let's welcome Trevor. I am so excited to welcome Trevor Bryan to the Art Class Curator podcast. Welcome, Trevor. Uh, Thank you. So I am excited to talk to you today because we have um, very similar interests when it comes to how you teach art. And you have written a book called The Art of Comprehension, which we're going to talk about today. Um, But before we get started, can you tell us a little bit more about you and your background and experiences, as well as how The Art of Comprehension came to be? Uh, Sure. Um, So I entered uh, teaching about a little bit over 20 years ago. And I actually, uh, at the time, thought I was going to be a classroom teacher. And my, my goal kind of going into the classroom was that I was going to be able to bring the arts into the, the general uh, education classroom. And so I actually did all of my student teaching um, to become a regular ed teacher. And I quickly realized that there is no way I was going to be able to bring the arts into the classroom. There's just too much stuff uh, for classroom teachers to do. Um, and then I also realized I just, I, I just missed the art space. I missed the art room. And so I went back. Um, to, uh, to um, become an art teacher. And um, once I, I, I still had the goal of trying to be, bring the academics into, or bring art into the academics. Um, and uh, so I, I, that was kind of my mission going into education. And I quickly realized um, once I became an art teacher and I was trying to bring the academic or art into the academics that I didn't have a good way of talking about art. And that became a real barrier for me. Um, especially with novice viewers, with my students and with other colleagues. And so the, my next mission really became trying to figure out um, a, a, a good way of talking about art with people who don't really have an arts background. Um, and so eventually those two worlds uh, collided um, around 10 years ago when I started really doing the work around the art of comprehension where I was able to bring the arts into the academic arena um, but I was also really able to, um, you know, figure out how to talk about art with with novice, what I think of as novice viewers. Yeah, I love that because that's one of the, the things that I come across as well is when I tell people what I do, they don't really understand because to them, art class is one way. Art class is mm-hmm. you're making these things and you hang them up and <laughs> that's it. And right. um, so I have to come up with other ways to describe it. So. That's interesting. Yeah, so that was really that was really the start. Um, and so I, around around 2011 ish um, is really when I really I was doing some stuff in around 2006 around this work, um, but it I, it really started to gain some traction um, where I felt like I was onto something around 2012, um, right around there. Um, and so for a few years, we just kind of I was able to work with some ELA teachers. Um, and we just kind of tried stuff out and, and slowly started to figure out an, an approach that made a lot of sense for them um, academically from a traditional academic standpoint and also is making sense in terms of really having um, rich, meaningful conversations around artworks. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So you're teaching in the classroom now as an art teacher? Yeah, I, I'm a, a K-5 teacher, uh, uh, art teacher. Okay. And so you work pretty closely with the classroom teachers on your campus? Um, I, I used to. The, uh, the, the teachers that I developed the program with have left the building. And so, um, you know, anytime, like, so I'm, I'm a little bit outside of the, the regular curriculum. It's a different approach. Um, you know, there's um, some people enjoy having me in their classroom. And like when you're trying to get any idea off the ground, there's other people that, you know, don't understand what you're doing or 
perhaps don't want to take the time to kind of think about it or are overwhelmed with what they feel like they have to do. Um, and so I work with, I work closely with some teachers, but the teachers that I developed this with that, um, I was in their classrooms constantly and it was a really, really wonderful, creative experience. Um, they're out of the buildings now. They're in different districts or just in different buildings. And I, I, I miss that terribly. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, uh, being an art teacher can be so isolating. So it's sure. nice that you had that opportunity to work with some other yeah. teachers. Yep. Yeah. So before we dig into your methodology, we definitely want to hear a lot more about that. Uh, but let's talk about the bigger picture and why do you think um, looking at art with students is so important and why is discussing art so important? Yeah, so I, I really believe that the, the arts basically exist in a lot of ways to help us understand our human experience. Um, and so um, I think all the arts do that. I think whether we're reading stories, which are works of art, um, whether we're watching a play, whether we're watching a movie, a TV show, looking at, uh, you know, what would be thought of as fine art. Um, the arts are really there to help us comprehend our, our human existence, right? They help us to think about what it's like to be human. Um, they help us to um, think about past experiences we've had or past experiences that other people have had. Um, and it helps us to kind of think about what's possible for our futures, um, what we can do, what types of things we can do. Um, and so I, I think engaging with the arts, um, whether we, regardless of the art form, is a really valuable um, part of, of, of developing, you know, who you are and, and who you could become and where you've been and where other people have been um, and getting a greater understanding of, um, right, the, the, the general human experience, what, you know, what we've been doing on this earth for thousands of years. And I think art is a direct pathway into that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I think too, that it's like, <laughs> I believe in the human spirit and what connects us. You can't, you can't connect yeah. anything I mean, you can't connect any better way than like ex experiencing what someone else has made, you know? It's a yeah, yeah, and the arts, I mean, the arts generally foster joy and connection, you know, even when, and especially when, um, t you know, times or topics are difficult. Um, yeah. People turn to the arts, we turn to song, um, we, we turn to ceremony, we, t we, talk, we turn to symbolism, giving flowers, right, dressing in black, these are all, right, these are all human expressions. Um, and the way that we communicate, the way that we express our humanness is going to be through an art form. Um, and, you know, visual arts is obviously one of, one of the ways that, that we can communicate. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that. So you've, you've said that art should be thought of as academic. What do you, what does that mean to you? And why do you think that that is a distinction that should be made? Yeah, so I, I think traditionally the arts have sort of been thought of outside the academic realm. And I think, so number one, I think, right, we put reading and writing in the academic realm and a good writer is an artist and books are works of art and writing is an art form. And so right there, you know, there's not a lot of reason to separate the two. Um, I think <laughs> reading and writing should be thought of as part of arts education. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, though, is that when when we ask why do we learn to read, what's it for? It's not so that we can pass a test. It's not so we can just read a half hour before we go to bed. It's not to increase your reading level. It's it's really to talk about what we were just kind of saying. It's to understand our human experience, right? The arts and and learning to read and helps us to create a better life for ourselves. It helps us to, to, uh, to grow our understanding of, of others, of ourselves, um, of what's possible. And so um, when, we, when we think of it that way, I think the arts play into that, right? The arts help us to understand what it means to be human. They help us to grow. They help us to think. They help us to communicate. Um, the, you know, if someone is starting a business, they have to communicate effectively. And the way that they're going to communicate effectively is through some of the art forms. Most likely it's going to be a combination of art forms. Um, but, uh, right, we can, so we tend not to think about art as, as communication. A lot of times I think it's thought of as self-expression and, and those aren't necessarily, um, yeah, I don't think that's that accurate. I think for some artists that is, but I think a lot of it is it's communication. And um, if we think about it as, in terms of comprehension and communication, then 
there's no reason, you know, there's no reason to say that's not an academic uh, pursuit. Uh, the other thing that always, the other example that I always give is this idea that in, in English class, you can read a play and get tested on a play, and that is seen as an academic endeavor. But if the drama club, it takes three months to do a close read of that play to figure out who the characters are and the symbolism in the play and how they're going to create the sets and how they're going to play, you know, the parts and present the play, that's somehow non-academic. Doesn't That just doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> well, I've never, I have never thought about that in terms of, like, why you know, they read books and that's considered an academic, but then, no, oh, I have never, yeah. ever it, thought about right. that way. That's fascinating. Yeah. And then, I mean, I was just talking to somebody who, you know, they were kind of putting down, they didn't want their, their smarter kids to be pulled out for like an art enrichment. Um, and, you know, but, but like if your kid, if those, if the same kid went to a museum, that teacher wouldn't say like, oh, that's such a waste of time right like it's there's a there's a weird thing that people do i don't know it's like in their heads that how they perceive things that drawing in school is um you know non-academic not that important extracurricular whatever you want but going to a museum or going to a, a broadway play is <laughs> seen as enriching yeah, <laughs> right yeah, and, yeah. right there's like a there's a weird I don't know where it comes from, but that's, it's so odd, right? It is weird. You know, cause right now in my, my kid's life, my daughter is in fifth grade and she is in an intermediate school for the first yeah. time. And next year she is going to get to choose her electives. And so all the moms this year have been like, well, you know, this kid wants to take this, this kid wants to take that. But all the ones where the kids want to take art, the parents are not happy about it. And yeah. I, they're talking to me, you know, knowing what my job is. <laughs> right. I do for a living. Yeah. I'm right. like, okay, I really need to know why. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, oh, well, band teaches them discipline and, and you know, choir teaches them this and that. But I was like, does art not do those things too? It's, they just see it as like a blow off. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a strange thing, right? And if yeah. you just put it in terms of communication, um, I think, that, I mean, I think for a lot of people, Right? Most people aren't going to grow up to be singers and most people aren't going to grow up to be actors. But having a having a, a good understanding of how those art forms are used to communicate effectively is is really valuable information. Um, if you're trying to put a you know a business plan together and you need a spokesperson and you need a logo and you need you know the the interior design of, of whatever you're proposing, having an understanding of how these these things work in order to communicate um, is really helpful for you to kind of get the vision that you want, the story that you're going to tell, to kind of put it, to get it to be put into place for other people to understand it. And if those, if you don't have an understanding, you're going to be relying on other people to tell that story. Um, and I think there's a lot of room then for, you know, that story to be told incorrectly or, or not as effectively. Um, you know, and so just having that general knowledge and really being able to think about it, not necessarily be able to do it per se, but to be able to think about it, um, I think is, is very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like what you said too, about how, you know, art is viewed as self-expression, but that you don't really think that that's true in most cases. I think you're exactly right about that. I like thinking about it in terms of communication. I'm wondering if the self-expression thing is sort of an elitist thing that came out of I think so. I mean, I think, you know, that the, the artists that, so, oh, I know a, a decent amount of, of working artists, professional artists, and um, they, they're not, they're trying out ideas. They're not necessarily waking up and saying, oh, I, you know, I feel depressed this morning. I better make a picture of my depression, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of a, a caricature of what an artist does. I, you know, I think they try, they try to make things that are interesting. They try to explore different ideas. Um, you know, some of them might be more tangible ideas, right? Uh, you know, uh, sunlight hitting a beach um, or, you know, or whatever it is, or the peacefulness of what it's when sunlight hits a beach that might be right. And other artists are going to work more abstractly where they're just kind of playing around with these things. Um, but I think it's just a lot of work. I think, it, I think uh, creativity is just, a, you know, creative work work what we think of as creativity is really a byproduct of, of just doing lots of work and mm -hmm. putting stuff out there and kind of seeing what resonates both with you as an artist um, but also with 
with your audience. Um, yeah. So I think the self-expression is a little bit overstated. Um, not that it can't be that, but I think, you know, when you're writing a novel and it takes you a year to write it, you know, there's a lot of editing and revision and you have to get the thing to work. It's not all about just every day I'm going to just, you know, sit down at my keyboard and express myself. I'm going to feel into these words today. Yeah, right? Like it just doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. It's just kind of you're exploring this idea and hopefully it resonates with other people and hopefully it, you are engaged with it enough to hold your interest because in order to be a professional creator, um, you really have to be dedicated to making stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, and that, that too reminds me, I just watched, did you ever see that documentary on um, Netflix about creativity? Uh, abstract is that the the Netflix series abstract no I think it's just called creativity but it, he they it was a guy who was writing a no he was a scientist studying creativity and he was talking about how what creativity is is um, being exposed to a lot of different ideas from a lot yeah. of different places and putting them together in new ways so as right. you were talking I started to think about that yeah, Steve Jobs has a quote that I, when I present, uh, uh, connect, uh, creativity is just connecting things. Yeah. Right? And so it's just taking two things uh, that um, generally don't go together um, and, and, putting it, and putting them together to create something new. You know, I don't think it has to be totally new in order to be creative, but just two different things that are, you know, two different things that are, are put together. Uh, the, 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 one of the best artists when I present that I show is an artist, Christoph Neiman, who was in the abstract, the Netflix series Abstract, and he's an illustrator. I think he has the most New York, um, uh, New York, not New York Times, the New Yorker covers. He's had the most New York cover covers, but he has a great um, little Instagram account called Abstract Sunday, where he just takes ordinary objects and turns them into something. And it can take him hours to figure these things out, but he'll turn like a avocado into a baseball mitt or a sock into a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just taking these, this one thing and connecting it to something else to create an image. And it's a really good example of what creativity is. And, yeah. and then how it works. It takes them a long time. It doesn't, um, they're very simple, but um, it can take them a long time to come up with a, a connection that's interesting. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to look that up. I wrote it. Yeah. I wrote it down. You said Christoph Neiman? Christoph Neiman, yep. The Netflix, uh, the, the abstract, it's, here, it's uh, from here, um, uh, the first season, is a, is a, that, that episode, and he also does some great talks, um, but he's a great person to, to listen to because he's someone who, um, is a very successful creator, but he's also very good at talking about uh, what creativity is and, and, and how he thinks about it. Cool. Well, I'll put that link too in the show notes. So if Yeah, listening. awesome. I think this will be artclasscurator.com slash 41, episode 41. Okay. okay. So now that we've kind of covered the basics on why you think this is important or why we both think this is important, um, let's dive into your, into your methodology, into the art of comprehension. Art of comprehension. Can you give us a brief overview of what that is? Yeah. So, I mean, so as we've kind of said, the, the art of comprehension is really an approach to, um, to get people talking and thinking about artworks, um, whether they're visual pieces or, or stories um, or plays. Um, and uh, that's all really all that it is, although it's sort of I, my book came out through a, a publishing company that normally does ELA work, uh, English language arts work. Um, and it's kind of billed as a way of teaching comprehension, which largely is associated with reading comprehension. Um, it's really, we use comprehension skills constantly to make sense of everything around us. So the, your listeners, you right now are using comprehension skills to, um, to comprehend what I'm saying. Um, and so, although we, I, you know, it's kind of geared towards the ELA community a little bit, it's really um, a way of getting people to talk about art. And again, books are works of art. So when we're talking about um, books, when we're talking about when we're reading great writers, we're, you know, we're reading the works of artists. Um, and so um, the approach in the art of comprehension can be applied to a, a book, it can be applied to a video, it can be applied to an artwork, it can be applied to a play, a TV show. Um, anything that's an art form that, uh, especially if it has uh, any kind of narrative in it, um, it's going to be uh, very easily applied. Okay, so most of our listeners probably are art teachers. Mm -hmm. And so can you give us like a little more comprehensive 
definition of what comprehension is. I think we, we are, we're all kind of bright enough to get a good idea, but yeah. from an English language arts teacher standpoint, what, what is comprehension? So there's basically, there's comprehension strategies, which is what most people think in the ELA community. And I, you know, I'm an art teacher, so I'm, yeah. you know, well, I did write a book, so I'm, I'm, talking, I'm <laughs> Straddling too. talking out of turn. I'm sort of not talking out of turn, <laughs> right? But there's comprehension strategies. And when I was developing the art of comprehension, I was really looking at the comprehension strategies that are used to teach kids to read well as a way of getting into artworks um, with the theory that they're they're both works of art and so and we use comprehension skills all the time um so that we could we could maybe have we could generate better conversations around artworks for somebody who doesn't have the art history background um that's that's um that's often needed in order to talk about artwork uh the way it's been done you know traditionally or for the last you know 100 years or so 200 years, whatever it is. Um, and so comprehension is, you know, finding key details is one comprehension skill, uh, synthesizing information, which we just talked about, um, you know, making, uh, taking the key details and, and assigning meaning to them, thinking about symbols, uh, making connections, which is um, a really, for me, that became a really important one. Again, it ties back to this idea of creativity. Um, so that when we actually are getting people to make connections to artwork to books, we're actually teaching them to be more creative. Um, and, you know, so that's that's kind of how I think about comprehension a little bit uh, is, um, you know, the comprehension skills that they use in ELA, but making meaning of something. And, and I really believe in that idea of making connections, because I think when viewers or readers make a connection, especially what I call a strong link connection, um, that's where it becomes it becomes personally relevant to them. And so when I when I have people looking at artwork, I want that artwork, whether they like the artwork or not, I want them to be able to make a connection because I think then that artwork, um, you know, has a chance of being personally relevant to them. Yeah, that's actually my number one goal <laughs> in yeah. my, my job. And I just did a podcast episode about it a few weeks ago where I decided to stop using the term art appreciation and started mm -hmm. to call it art connection instead, because yeah. I think appreciation is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to like what is actually possible. Right. And, and so the, the ability to get people to make a connection is really what I'm after. And that's kind of the whole thing. And it sounds kind of simple um, and it sounds very non-academic, but I, you know, if you, if you, if you want people to kind of take ownership of a, of a work of art, if you want it to impact their life in some way, then it's, they have to make a connection to it. And if they don't, if you don't set them up to make a connection, um, a lot of people aren't going to make connections, especially if the, if the artwork is not immediately um, something that resonates with them. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is like, how, how do you set them up to make a connection? So, um, so in the book, there's like, so in the book, there's, uh, uh, there's like six steps and they're just, they sort of happened organically over the years when I was leading these conversations, um, in classrooms, I, I was to kind of lead them to that point. I, I was, I realized that I was asking a lot of the same questions, not necessarily exactly the same way every time. Um, but you know, there were certain things that we did to kind of lead them. And so the, the the way that um, I, I basically do that is is trying to get them to to hone in on the mood or to hone in on the mood, right? We right the way that we connect as human beings is through moods. So you can tell if someone walks in the room whether they're sad, excited, or angry. Um, when you know someone you love is sad, you feel sad. Um, when someone you love is excited, you feel excited, right? The, the way that we, we connect as human beings is through how we feel. It's the emotional connection. It's the reaction to what's happening around us. When, when our community goes through a tragic event, we, we all go through the tragic event, and that's how we connect. Um, and so really getting kids to focus on the moods, both in stories from an ELA perspective and, and the moods of the artwork and thinking about how those moods are crafted is really the first step of getting them to um, understand 
um, or get them to connect to that. And so once we identify a mood and we can look at how the mood was crafted, which helps them then turn around and craft their own artworks and think about their own um, their their own uh, the own work that they're doing. We also get into symbolism and theme very quickly. And so ways of connecting to artworks is are through the mood, through the symbolism, um, through the theme. And we can then take we can then uh, um, connect those to our own lives, to instances of our own lives where we might have felt the same way. We have a sim we have a, a symbol of our own that represents frustration or sadness or hope or support. Um, or, you know, or that theme resonates with our life somehow. And so once you set people up into that position, then it's very easy to make a connection. Um, and then the artwork becomes representative of something other than, you know, the brush strokes or, you know, just the, just the, you know, that his use of color was different than someone else's use of color, mm -hmm. but we can assign more meaning to that artwork. Um, and it doesn't always mean that they're going to love it, but at least um, they're going to be able to say like, you know, they, they will be able to make a connection to it. Um, and then they, once they make a connection, they can decide if they like the way the artist represented this theme or created this mood, or perhaps they enjoy a different representation um, of that mood. Because there's only so many moods we experience as humans. You yeah. know, and so just like songs, right? There's a joke is like there's breakup, so there's falling in love songs and there's breakup songs, right? <laughs> um, art's kind of the same way. There's like, you know, hopeful paintings and kind of sad paintings and maybe some paintings have, you know, moods in between. Um, but it's really, the, it's really by, by getting them to recognize the moods is, is, is a really easy way into talking about any form of art. And that's what art works about, I think. Yeah, agreed. So I was, um, my podcast listeners, listeners are probably really tired of me using this example because it just blew my mind like last month. I was listening to Brene Brown uh -huh. and she was talking about emotional literacy because you know her whole, yep. path, her whole new path is getting this into schools and teaching people the right, right. emotions. And she said in her research that most people on average know only three emotions, sad, mm -hmm. mad, and happy. Yeah. But that to be like an emotionally literate person, you have to know 30 different emotions. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, have you seen that play out at all in your lessons about mood? And, and have you seen the, the, the emotional literacy or the vocabulary surrounding mood get more advanced in your students as they've done this more? Yeah. So, I mean, generally, so the way that I, I use a lot of picture books because um, I teach elementary school, but even when I work with adults or when I work with uh, high school kids, I'll use picture books because they're just very accessible. And so we, by using things that are kind of made for the age group that I'm working with, um, by using things that are accessible, I set them up for success. And in the beginning, we basically can just kind of separate things as happy or sad, right? And there's a lot of um, very simple pictures and we can differentiate you just differentiate them based on happy or sad but then right as we go along this and they become more confident and they can identify that it's a negative image right sad can become lonely right or bored or upset and so we can we can expand that vocabulary and we can expand that thinking and then we can talk about okay what word do you think is the exact word for this especially if you're putting it into a context of a narrative where you have a little bit more information about why the character's feeling the way that they're, they're feeling. Um, you, you know, and, and so that, yeah, we definitely see a broader conversation around uh, the emotions, and that's why this also works pretty well for the SEL, social emotional learning, the SEL uh, yeah. learning, because you, you're having conversations, and then when you ask them to make a connection, when have you felt this way? When have you seen someone else that felt way? Right? It's a way of developing empathy. And yeah. so we're using that artwork as a jumping off point um, to talk about our own lives. Yeah, I think that's so very important. I'm just thinking about my own evolution as a person. I wish I would have <laughs> social, <laughs> social learning stuff when I was a child. I was yeah. a very good student, but uh, otherwise I was a bit of a mess. So <laughs> yeah, um, we all kind of are. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is very true. So uh, I think that's really awesome. So what are some, do you have any um, tools or or can you point to some specific resources or tools from your book or from somewhere else that you can point teachers to if they want to get 
and grow. Yes, stories? yeah. So the so the the main tool of the art of comprehension is called the access lenses, and it's um, it was illustrated by Peter H. Reynolds, who most of your uh, listeners probably know. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I do a lot in the book. I use the dot and ish as examples. Um, and, and Peter's been super supportive of the work. He actually, uh, I was lucky enough to, for him to do my cover for me. He stuck Ramon from Ish on the cover, which I was thrilled about. Um, but he illustrated the access lenses. And what the access lenses are, um, are basically the way that humans show emotion. And so uh, you're going to see that when someone acts. You're going to see them do these things. You're going to see them in illustrations. You're going to see them in paintings. You're going to see them when they're dancing. Um, you're going to see these uh, uh, these access lenses show up when you read a book. Um, if someone looks sad, the way that that's presented or written about is going to basically be the same way. Um, and so the access lenses is really the heart of AOC. Uh, there's a uh, you can get the the access lenses for free uh, through the Stenhouse website, which is my publisher. So if you um, did a search of Trevor Bryan, The Art of Comprehension, under resources, um, there's a way to print out the access lenses for free. Well, we'll um, put that in the show. Yeah, that's really the, and we can, you can put an image in the show notes too. Um, uh, but that's really the heart of the, um, uh, AOC. And what it is, it's a, it's a way for kids to identify key details. Um, and then those key details are going to synthesize into the mood. That's, you know, that's their text evidence, um, you know, which they need for testing, but it's also the information that you're synthesizing into meaning. Can you share with us, um, like, two or three of the access and examples of the access lenses? Yeah, so the, the, the top three on that are the easiest. It's facial expressions, body language, and action, or color. Um, and you, you it, it's even in writing, you're going to see the color lens. So uh, one of the things when I was kind of researching my book, I would just sort of read the beginning of books, and then um, they would start off all rainy. <laughs> <laughs> or the beginning of the chapters, yeah. and then the end, they would be all sunny, right? And if you go to a Broadway play during the sad scenes, it's raining, you know, or thunder in the background, and then the you know the big number, the lights are on, the birds are chirping, right? It happens all the time. So colors used constantly in storytelling, um, uh, you, you know, even you know the, the the villains are in dark colors and the superheroes mm -hmm. are in bright colors. Um, it's a very simple way, but there's it happens all the time because we only have so many ways of um, showing emotion, right? And that's how we tell stories. And so body language and action, whether a character is, you know, um, you know, flopping on the bed or, or, you know, sitting in the corner or standing still or, you know, running to the front door or sprinting to the front door, um, you know, so um, their facial expression, um, eyebrows, when you look at illustrations are a great place to look to figure out uh, emotions of characters. And you can track their eyebrow across most picture books when the when the mood changes. Um, and so there's sounds and silence, um, even in the, the book um, uh, Ish is a great example where Peter uses the sound, what, you know, the access lens a lot where um, you know, when Leon makes fun of Ramon, Ramon couldn't even answer, right? That silence and that show that that shows how Ramon's feeling. And then when he burst into um, Marisol's room, right, he was about to yell, but fell silent. That again shows his uh, his reaction to that event. That's the emotion, right? That shows his mood that he was surprised. Um, and so they're just little things that kids can look for. And kids, it's great because preschool kids can look for these things, kindergarten kids. Um, and then it not only helps them to, to pull out key details from pictures and from books that they're reading, but these are the types of things that they need to put into their um, that they need to put into their pictures and their stories when they're crafting, or even if they're making a little film, right? Thinking about how they're going to act this part, how they're going to show it. Um, these are these are the types of things that actors do, that writers do, and that uh, illustrators and painters do. I love that. While you were talking, I had this intense need to go watch Hamilton again. Hamilton again with your access lenses handout. Yeah, because I kept thinking of examples from Emma Hamilton junkie, but yeah, awesome. Yeah, I can't wait. Seen it? Comes. No, I haven't seen the, oh. the uh, musical, but but that's also like so that Hamilton's such a good example. Just to go back a little bit of right the idea right. So when Lin Manuel wrote that, right, he was obsessed with rap, and when he was a kid and obsessed with rap, rap wasn't even considered music, mm -hmm. right? So I'm sure there was tons of people that were saying that is a waste of time. 
why are you wasting your time with that nonsense, right? That's so, right? And then when it became music, it was lowbrow music, right? Yeah. And now it's on Broadway, right? He's hip hop and rap to write, write a historical, um, right? A historical musical based on, right? Our history. Um, and who, who would make the argument that that was non-academic work? Exactly. Well, I am of the mind and um, that Hamilton is the greatest work of art ever made. It, it, it very well could be, <laughs> right? You about it, like, you, yeah. should go, you absolutely should go see it. You live in New Jersey. Yeah. You have no excuse not to. Right. But um, there's a scene like when Aaron Burr at the end, he gets madder and madder as you go. As, as, yeah. as the musical goes on and then he has this number near the end where he gets so so mad and he, he, you've got the facial expressions yeah. and, and but then there's like this swirling red around yeah. him. i mean like yeah. the, the color everything you were saying and the silence i mean it's all in there yeah it's all there and you're gonna see these things over mm -hmm. and over again and you can understand them as a five-year-old you know yeah. or however old you are all stories kind of work the same way and then the other thing that when i work with ela teachers is mood structures every story is going to have a change of mood mm -hmm. um and so tracking that is really what the story is about you know uh the, the story is about an event happens and the the character responds to it and why are they responding to that that way that's what the story is. It's not the event. It's how the character will respond. And the way that they're going to respond is going to be somehow emotionally. They're either going to be angry about it, sad about it, scared about it, nervous, right? Worried, excited, whatever it is. That's the story. And so when we look at art and we look at these very simple pictures and get kids to identify that, um, they're practicing, right? Uh, their comprehension skills in order to make meaning. And the more accustomed they get to using these lenses and um, applying them to different forms of text uh, that the not only are they going to uh, be better at comprehending stories they're going to be better at crafting stories mm -hmm. yeah better at everything I mean it just the whole our world today being so visually focused absolutely you know, yeah they, they need absolutely need these skills um, yeah and it's, it's what I one of the things that's nice about the art of comprehension you know is that it can be applied so widely to different mediums um, and so there's no reason why when kids are watching TV shows, even, right, the really dumb ones that kids like to watch, right, that aren't certainly, you know, fine art or, mm -hmm. you know, beautifully crafted, they're generally solidly told stories because mm -hmm. they weren't good stories. No one would watch them at all. Um, so they're crafted in stories. But kids should be using comprehension skills all the time because there's a story there and they have to make meaning of it. And the more they can identify how this was crafted, um, not only, again, not only is that going to help their comprehension, right, but it's also going to help them to um, craft their own stories yeah. and, and, share their, and share their voices. I love it. So um, before I ask you my next question, I do need to nerd out. Um, that is so cool that Peter Reynolds did your book. Um, <laughs> yeah, <that's awesome. laughs> How did that happen? Did you just ask him? Uh, yes. Sort of. I, um, <laughs> we met on Twitter. So, oh, okay. you know, so for everyone who kind of, you know, hems and haws about going on social media. Um, I sent um, he and his brother a tweet, I don't know, how many, around 2014 or whatever, and they both got back to me right away. And so we just always sort of had this little connection that he appreciated the work that I was doing. I'm not really sure how it happened. And then we um, kind of went back and forth and we were sort of, he appreciated the work around visual text that I was doing and trying to bring it into the academic arena. And we kind of talked about trying to collaborate somehow. We had no idea what that would look like and it never worked out. And so I think um, my book got postponed, thankfully. And Peter had written The Art of Comprehension in his very distinct handwriting um, at one point point and so I asked him if I could you know maybe put it in my book somehow and he said yeah sure what else and then he said what else is your cover oh, need <laughs> and so I was like texting you know the people I was developing this with and I was like I think Peter just offered to do the cover but I did I was like so afraid that I misinterpreted the sentence yeah because um, he's super busy and especially the last few years he's been unbelievably busy I mean I think yeah. he put out four books last year or something three or four books he has a couple other coming out others coming out and uh but yeah it was a thrill i mean it was really um a thrill to just kind of have the opportunity to collaborate with them on some level um and then i asked him if he would do the access lenses because that was really the other really important visual mm -hmm. um and he said he would do that too and uh so that was you know super super fun um yeah. super grateful 
uh, super surreal uh, yeah, all at the same time. I because I I hadn't even met him at that point in person. We had met um, at the uh, NAEA convention up in um, was it in Boston? The uh, this where was one. it? Yeah, this last one was in Boston. Was it? It was in Boston. Yeah. So I met him for the first time up in Boston after after he did, did all the work for me. So, oh, that's cool. But, yeah, he's been great. He's a great guy. Um, obviously, his books are wonderful. Um, I've been using the dot for years. Oh, yeah. um, I, I still, when I work with groups and kids, I still get people saying different things about how they're thinking about those images. Um, but yeah, so he's been he, he's been great to me. So I really appreciate his support. That's yeah, been that is super fun. cool. Yeah. Well, I love that, what, about what you just said too, I love how you can teach the same artwork hundreds of times with yeah. all different groups of students, and you always hear something you've never heard before. And yeah, I've literally talked about the book, The Dot, I mean, probably almost 200 times Yeah, um, going through the same images with the same groups. And I almost every time, not every time, but almost every time, I would say more often than not, someone says something that I just, oh, that's a really interesting way to think about it or that, well, that's a great word to use. Um, and uh, it always happens. And that is, I mean... You know, I think it's great. And I think it's, I think there's something really valuable to revisiting, um, especially, you know, for me, revisiting these works that do mean so much to me mm -hmm. and are so interesting. Um, I think that's a testament to, to a lot of teachers who are kind of new to talking about art with their students are afraid that they're going to get crickets, you know, that the students aren't going to have anything to say or they're going to be bored. Yeah. yeah. I have never found that to be true. No, I think the other thing by revisiting artworks, I think for your kids who are a little bit less confident by, by giving them another experience with it, they already kind of know some of the thinking. And so there's, you're slowly trying to get them to feel a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more confident. So mm -hmm. by having that repeated experience, it, you know, it gives them something to maybe hang on to or, you know, or maybe they can even, you know, raise their hand and share. Um, because they sort of know what to expect around this work of art. And I think that's a really important aspect of um, revisiting artworks. Yeah, definitely. And then it, beco it just becomes a part of who they are and it becomes absolutely a yep. it's like a, yeah. it's like a friend they have, they carry with them. Yeah. And the other, I mean, the other thing for the work that I do, the other thing is that when, when they really can take ownership of a very simple image, and that's one of the reasons why I started using Peter's work so much um, when they can own that simple image then they can apply that to more complex images. Mm -hmm. So the more confident they are, the more uh, grounded that image is. And, and his images, you can use almost all the axis lenses. So, um, so they become much more confident using the lenses. They have a very clear mental model of what that looks like, of what it sounds like, of how they can apply these different lenses to you know, a handful of pictures that they can recall very easily. And so then that makes it much easier for them to apply to more complicated works or to just new works. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, you know, you said you've used a lot of picture books for this process. What yeah. are your favorite artworks to use um, outside of picture books? So the, so the artworks that I use the most, um, but I do use picture books most of the time. And I think they're in a lot of elementary school art rooms they are totally underutilized because they really are fantastic artists um, and they're making artworks for kids on their level so they're very accessible to the kids but I do some work with the Princeton University Art Museum so a lot of the artworks that I use are from that collection um, their permanent collection and I'm fortunate enough to be able to take my fifth graders to that museum um, every year um, and so uh, they, they have wonderful show it's a great museum it's a very small museum um, but um, I use a lot of their collection uh, you know, Winslow Homer, they have some Onays, they have some uh, early American paintings that I use a lot. Um, there's a great Kenseth painting that I use all the time. And then, uh, but we use, you know, we use Ad Reinhardt. We've, you know, we use lots of different sculptures, um, you know, whatever. It, you can really apply it to almost any artwork because every artwork, whether intended or not, is going to be able to be assigned a mood. Yeah. Oh, and that's when, well, I went to your NAEA session in Boston. Okay. I was sitting oh, okay. on the floor. I was going to talk to you afterwards, but there was a lot of people who also wanted to talk to you afterwards. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll just, just I'll, I'll leave. Um, yeah, so I went to your session and, I, and that's one of the things I went away with was n noticing that the artwork that you chose wouldn't have been ones that I would have naturally chosen for mood, yeah. but that yeah. we were still able to find the mood in them. 
Yeah, I think so. When I think about choosing artwork, um, it's interesting that you say that you wouldn't have found them for mood because I usually try and pick very uh, accessible things. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I, when I look at artworks, I want them to have a clear mood. And maybe it's just a clear mood that I have, and then I can kind of lead people, I can guide people there through the process. Um, but I really do try and pick, especially when I'm introducing this and working with you know new people, um, I try and pick artworks that are highly accessible so that there will be a high level of success. Um, or things that maybe the mood's not as clear, but once we identify a mood, it's something that everyone's gonna be able to relate to. Yeah. Um, so again, to try and get them to uh, have a really rich, um, strong uh, personal connection to it. Yeah, because we all did. We did find the mood. You know, we were you had us talk to our neighbor, and yeah, uh, yeah, we did find the mood, and it was, but it wasn't ones that I immediate like immediately knew exactly right what it was. You know, right. but I think yeah. that I think that was what made it interesting. Is we we got to really think about it and talk about it. Yeah, we, um, we, so at the art museum, when I do stuff with there, we, we sometimes we pair really um, odd artworks together, um, but we pair them through moods. So that a lot of times they're either the same mood or they're kind of opposite moods. But a lot of times um, you wouldn't, they're ones that you wouldn't necessarily immediately pair together. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really wonderful. The kids do a wonderful job and then we have them com compare those to characters in books or to the moments in their own lives or places. Um, we get them to make connections that way. Um, and uh, um, it's that, that's kind of, I mean, it's, it's really fun to try and, and, and find artworks that maybe um, like the Ad Reinhardt paintings, which are all black, right? Getting kids to think about that both in terms of a, uh, a, a negative mood, which they automatically gravitate to because it's black, so it's depressing, mm -hmm. sad. But then also thinking about, you know, when is that darkness a good thing? Or when do we feel comfortable in the darkness? Maybe, mm -hmm. and so we've talked about kids laying in bed before you go to sleep or playing hide and go seek, um, or just being outside in the summer at night where it's dark and you hear just the noises. Um, and so the kids were really starting to think about that in terms of going into your inner world, right? And that quietness that we, when we can, uh, we can find that, that quietness inside ourselves. So it was a really interesting conversation around an Ad Reinhardt painting for a 10 year old kid to have, 11 yeah. year old kid. That's, you know? really, that's really awesome. I love that. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, um, I think it's about time to wrap up, if, but before okay. we do, um, one, how can teachers connect with you online? Sure. Uh, through Twitter, Trevor A. Bryan okay. is my handle, um, through the Stenhouse website. Um, if you do Trevor Bryan, uh, the art of comprehension Stenhouse, um, four o'clock faculty is the blog that I, I, uh, write with my, uh, good friend, Rich Chiz, who wrote four o'clock faculty. Um, some of you might know that book that came out through Dave Burgess, um, company. Um, and, um, I'm on Facebook. There's an art of comprehension, um, Facebook page. I'm on Facebook. Uh, there's a YouTube channel that has some videos of me talking about implementing, um, uh, the art of comprehension and applying it to different pictures and, and some different texts. Um, that would, I think that's Trevor Bryan, I think is my YouTube channel. Okay. Um, I think those are about those. Are basically yeah, that's good. I'm on Instagram, Trevor Bryan. <laughs> all You're all over the place. Okay. We yeah. will link to those yeah. Um, yeah. on the show notes. Sure. And in addition, so the last question that I ask all of my guests is which artwork changed your life? So, Hmm. So the, the artwork that I would have to say, I don't know if it changed my life in the, in the traditional sense of, you know, of right, me walking around the corner and seeing it. And then I was so floored that um, I fell in love with art. But there's a painting at the Princeton um, Museum of Art, the Princeton University Art Museum, I guess. Um, it's a it's a it's a, a John uh, Kensett painting. It's called Lake George, and it's a painting that has lived with me for about twenty years. Um, and um, when I was painting, I used to paint plein air a lot, and it was a painting that I loved when I was kind of trying to you know paint plein air paintings all the time. Um, and then that painting become became really paramount for me when I was doing the art of comprehension, and so. 
uh, I had an opportunity to present at Princeton using this. And, and when I went to go meet with the person who was uh, interested in me coming, she wanted to talk to me a little bit about what I was doing. And so we talked about that painting um, as, a, as, a, as a symbol of hope, but also as a, as a symbol of struggle. Um, and I think that conversation around that painting is, you know, she kind of locked into it and got it. And then that painting was also the first painting um, where a 10-year-old kid wrote a response to. And I was like, that is the way that I want kids talking about art. And I want, that's the experience that I want to give kids. That's the joy that I want to share around the artworks. And so um, that painting has stuck with me. There's also that painting. Um, so, that, so that boy in fifth grade wrote a response, and I can share that with you so you could post it on the show notes if you want. I love that. One of the goals around the art of comprehension was that I believe that people carried around poems and scripture and songs with them and that they would, in, in times of need or struggle, they would recall these. And <clears throat> I'm getting a little choked up here. <laughs> <laughs> it's my um, favorite when people get yeah, choked up. Right, about so <laughs> what I wanted, I wanted people to carry around paintings with them. And I didn't think that a lot of people who were not art students carried around paintings with them. And so that painting, um, I had a friend whose mother-in-law got sick and he was not an art student. He was one of the guys that I worked with a lot. And um, when he was asked how he felt in front of a painting, he would just say, I feel stupid. I don't know what I'm looking at, right? That was his response. And when he found out that his mother-in-law you know, got sick, he, um, he left me a voicemail and just said, Trev, I went right to the Kensit painting. Oh. I was trying to find the hope. Um, so that painting is probably the painting that's sort of been with me the longest. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice old friend to have around. Um, and it's just, it's been, it's probably for me, it's that symbol that um, uh, I can share the joy that the arts have brought to my life with people who maybe haven't had a way into the arts before. So um, I'm going to say <laughs> Lake George <laughs> from Princeton University. <laughs> I think that I, definitely qualifies as a painting that's changed your life. That yeah, all right, good. <laughs> Maybe even in the traditional sense now. Yeah, so. yeah. It yeah. Doesn't, there is no traditional sense when it comes yeah. to that question. Yeah. Every time I've asked that question, it's been a completely different. I am sure. I would love to listen to all those responses. Yeah, it's, it's my favorite thing. So yep. that, was a beautiful, that was a beautiful answer, and it really is a, just a testament to this work is so important and that we should do it and um yes so thank you so much for um sharing about your experience today and your expertise and your heart yeah and, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity i always uh, love uh, love the opportunity to share what i do and and try and get art in front of people in a meaningful way so that's the mission so i appreciate yeah. that you are uh you know su supporting the mission in your own way and by uh having people share their voices i think it's wonderful so thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much to Trevor Bryan for the amazing interview in today's episode. And I was super moved by Trevor's art story. And it is not the first time that someone has teared up when talking about the artwork that changed their life. I want to encourage you to share your artwork that changed your life with us. You can send us a voice memo or a voicemail. The voice memo you can send to support at our artclasscurator.com or you can send a voicemail to 202-996-7972. You can leave the voicemail, make sure you say your name, where you're from, tell us your art story, and you might hear yourself on a future episode of the Art Class Curator podcast. These stories change lives. These stories impact people in ways that that you don't even know. So please consider telling us which artwork changed your life. All right. I will see you next time on the Art Class Curator Podcast. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Art Class Curator Podcast. Help more art teachers find us by reviewing the podcast and recommending it to a friend. Get more inspiration for teaching art with purpose by subscribing to our newsletter, Your Weekly Art Break. Recent topics include the importance of seeing art in person, famous and should be famous women artists, and 21 days of art from around the world. 
Subscribe at artclasscurator.com slash artbreak to receive six free art appreciation worksheets. Today's art quote is from Salvador Dali, and he says, A true artist is not one who is inspired, but one who inspires others. Thanks so much for listening. Have a wonderful week.